one of the things that, that we keep talking about, I was, I was dwelling on this and meditating on this uh, the other day, and it was amazing to think about, but then on the, uh, it was sad on the other, the other end. The, the situation that we put ourselves in with denominational doctrines. Because with a denominational doctrine, you are you have put yourself with people who are never going to allow you to grow beyond what that man-made doctrine is. You can't do it. Sure. They're, you're, they're going to stop you. Do, mm. do you. do you really not? I mean, I, I had never really put it in, in that kind of terms, and I was sitting there and just kind of dwelling, and I'm sure it was the Holy Spirit because I'm not that smart. But it was wherever they determine your walk is going to go to, that's it. If you become aligned with that. And I think one of the things that that really uh, got me was is that, I, you know, to that point, Thinking that way is, is that I was thinking in terms, you know, like the Southern Baptist Conference, you know, or association, mm -hmm. whatever that is. And the power that these men have over the life and walk of so many people. Mm -hmm. Because I listen to people that are, t that are in churches talk about their church wanted to do this, but they had to go talk to the, the, the association before they could do it. They, you know, wanted this person to be their, their pastor, but they had to go mm -hmm. to the association to get mm -hmm. approval for, you know, the, for that. And see, now those that are, that are aligned with that, that they would, this would be their answer to this. Well, we are the accountability part, you know, of the churches so that, you know, you know, we, we, can you know make sure that nobody's doing anything that they're not supposed to be, but and 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 in some terms I understand that. Okay, but then the other side of that, the side that's not being discussed, they have their own, they have their own doctrine. They have their their points of their doctrine that you have to agree with to be a part of that. And so when those doctrines, you know, and, and the thing is, is that they, their answer is, is that, well, you know, I believe, you know, we believe the Bible. Okay, well, do you believe in speaking in tongues? No, that's not for now. It's in the Bible. Okay, well, where's that at? That's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's not scripture. <clears throat> you start asking them. And, and the thing is, is that <clears throat> the enemy has done something in our comfort. Because you know, I told we've talked about the fact that we, God, our God, a lot in this in this country has become comfort, and we don't want that infringed on. We will protect it at all costs. We will go and and interpret anything based on that to make sure that it's not. Because I mean, I mean, just think about it this way. I get you on one. Do you realize that it doesn't matter what your salary is right now and how much you make, do you realize that you are in the 1% of the entire world in wealth? Mm -hmm. And so we, we don't think in that terms. We we measure based off of our comfort in, in, in this country. Mm -hmm. And then we also want to judge other people in other countries based on, on this, what we have here. And we become completely ignorant. And you you think about it when when you're filtering everything through this, you can't understand well why is somebody having a hard time here, you know, or or I well I give a little bit, I can give a little bit. Well, you're really not giving much. You think about it because we have wealth, a very high wealth, but yet. Other countries, it's like I was talking to somebody the other day. Well, I, I don't know if where's the last time that we've had Venezuelan poor where you're walking through uh, the dump trying to find something that you can either sell or eat. Never. You know, in Venezuela, 
in the early 2000s was like the United States. And within 10 years of uh, electing a socialist in there, they are now where they're at, where the people are so poor, so destitute. That just goes to show you, you know, well, that's not true socialism. That, well, that, that's usually the answer. But I mean, it is. Whenever you take for somebody, I, I love this, what, what Ben Shapiro, he's like one of my ma mind candy. And uh, it is. It, 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 stealing is stealing. It doesn't matter if you make it legal to steal. And that's what it is. It doesn't matter if you make laws to take something from someone else that is stealing. You know, and yeah, there there are flip sides to both, but we 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 look at things from that standpoint, you know. But and we forget things like what Jesus even talked about, right? He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Well, you know, there's some. Oh, he's talking about the little thing where the camels had to get down on their knees and scoop through there. Or he could have been talking about you know, it. Doesn't matter which way he's what what he was like referencing it to. It's difficult. That's what he was trying to get across. You know, everybody trying to split hairs. You know, on this. That's what he called uh, choking on a gnat and swallowing a camel. Mm -hmm. You know. We don't think in those terms. And the reason is, is that the very thing that we're talking about, it becomes so important for us to maintain our comfort that we'll go in debt. We will hoard our money. We won't help other people. It's, it's, and it's all based on that. You know, it's like, you know, you think about it even at Christmas time. I used to do this. I used to drive Tammy crazy because Tammy's a giver. Because she, so she wasn't looking at it from the perspective that I was looking at it. She's looking at it from her perspective. So Tammy's a giver. She loves to buy gifts for people and do things for people. And I'm looking at it like I got to buy this amount of money for this person and this amount of money for this person and this amount of money for this person. And money only goes so far. Yeah, and and it's and and, and the reason is is because. That's what's expected, or they may buy something for me of some equal gift. And if it's like, well, if that's the case, then I just keep my money. I'll buy my own present, you know, <laughs> if that's all that we're doing. You know, if we're only like exchanging the gifts based off of monetary value, I would just rather just keep my own money and just go buy my own gift, <laughs> you know. But see, the thing is, is that that's why. Because we've lost the entire understanding of giving even whenever it comes to Christmas time. And Christmas time, that's why I used to tell Tammy, I said, I wish that we could just like have a Christmas where all it's about is just like coming together with family and, and Jesus being the purpose and the reason that we come together. That being the thing that, that you know, instead of it being, you know, 40, 50 gifts all under a tree because of it. And it keeps getting bigger because we keep getting grandbabies and stuff. You know, they, our, our, everybody's growing, you know, our family's growing. My wallet is not growing, but they are, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And it's not, this is not a complaint about the amount of money you spend. It's about the heart behind it, the purpose behind it. Why are you buying the gifts for? Now, I will give Tammy this. Tammy buys because Tammy loves to give. And she'll go and she'll buy stuff. You know, except it's under certain situations, it's like, okay, no, I got to get this because they're going to give me this right here. That does happen once in a while. <laughs> but that's not the primary reason that she gives. She has a giving heart. And she loves to give to people. I mean, she does throughout the year. It's not just Christmas time. She does throughout the year. She'll go through it in the stores and She'll see something and she'll go, oh, so so well, like this is she'll buy that so she can give it to them. She's got a giving heart. <laughs> but now for me, I look at it and go, oh, that costs this. No. <laughs> Not today. Sorry. But somebody knows you thought about it. Well, this is true, but you know, you could do the same thing by calling them on the phone going, hey, I was thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> that cost me nothing. <laughs> Giving should cost. Mm -hmm. You think? Not money. You just made that up. 
No. Yes, you did. I mean, yeah, but. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, but. But given she cost, it should take something. Drama picture. Me. Drama picture. <laughs> right. But what we do is that we filter all this, everything that we do now through our comfort on this. And in the church, what we've done is that these denominations have created a doctrine that is a comfort to them. What it better, and, and I'm not like, there are a lot of, of them this way. Okay, so it's not just I'm singling out the Southern Baptist Convention, all right, or association. There are a lot of them. The Methodist Church is this way, you know. I mean, Naz Church of the Nazarene. I mean, there's all kinds of denominations that are this way. I remember back whenever I first got into ministry, I went at the recommendation of, of one of my pastors said, well, why don't you just go to the uh, superintendent of the Church of Nazarene and see about being able to preach for them because I grew up in the Church of the Nazarene. And whenever he and I talked for a few minutes, he said, we ain't got nothing for you. He said, because we just don't believe the same. Told me straight up. All of it because of the power of God in our life. I mean, I, I don't understand this because we are supernatural beings who worship a supernatural God. And yet, whenever the supernatural comes into play, it becomes uncomfortable. And we don't want to do it. We, we can't handle that. I mean, you think about it. That is the, the number one thing that Satan does to the church. Whenever it talk, I mean, just talking about in your individual life. If you look and see somebody that's sick, your spirit man is going, ooh, they're sick. Let's go lay hands on them. And then you go, oh, no, no, I can't do that. Where in front of people, what if it don't work? Well, I might intrude on I mean, we make we come up with all kinds of our excuses to not do it. And it bothers us because those of us that are Christ, when we see somebody that is sick, we don't just look at them like, oh, there's just another person. Oh, bless our, we don't even do the bless their heart thing. It's like that shouldn't be that way. That ain't the way that it is supposed to be. We know that that is part, a product of a fallen world. Mm -hmm. And we want to change that. But we will talk ourselves out of it. Mm -hmm. And then the enemy will help you. He'll, he'll do that because he definitely doesn't want you to be a part of that kind of stuff. Then we make denominations, would come up with denominations, which is nothing more than a, a separation, it's a division in the church that Satan come up with. Yeah. The moment that we start saying, okay, well, you can't play with us unless you believe this way. Mm -hmm. You have already, you've divided. Which just limits God's power in the church. Don't we? Yeah, well, see, I, <laughs> I don't understand why it is that we just don't go, this is my doctrine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's it. If, it. if I find it in the word of God, we'll do it. True. We'll do it. I'm not saying if they're not going to believe part of it, why are you going to believe any of it? Well, exactly. When you become I mean, selective about the pieces of it. Yeah. I mean, why are you going to believe any of it if you can believe all of it? Absolutely. That makes you the standard instead of God. Absolutely. Right. And how would, yeah. anybody, how would anybody who you're trying to share God Christ with and trying to save them, why would they believe anything that you have to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you go, well, this is true, but this is not, and this is, yeah. well, yeah. why am I going to believe any of it? I call that red with a magic marker and a highlighter. I don't it's like that. Right. Oh, that sounds really good. I'm gonna use that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the and, and that's the problem that we cannot have anymore. That's one of the things that discipleship used to actually teach, take care of. Yeah. Because see, I did not realize the the amount of importance that it was when the Lord had me disciple Casey. Because I'm going to tell you right now, Casey was the first person I ever discipled. The Lord said, I want you to disciple him. I want you to do it the way I'm telling you. I will tell you to do it. And basically it was, <laughs> there it is. And live it out. Live it. See, this is the difference. See, 
You notice that whenever Jesus was teaching his disciples, he didn't just teach them by word only. Exactly. He showed them how to do it. He showed them how to heal people. Then when he showed them how to heal people, then he was like, I expect this of you. Right? I mean, you think about it. When Jesus, think about it whenever the epileptic, the, the father of the epileptic boy came to Jesus. Jesus had been up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. <laughs> Transfiguration, I think, had just taken place, if I've I'm, I'm got yes. my chronology right. Yeah. He had come back down. The other disciples were out doing ministry while he was doing it. They had tried to lay hands on a boy that had epilepsy and could not heal him. So that they bring him to Jesus. The man tells him. Jesus' answer is, is that, you, you faithless generation, how long am I going to be with you? He rebuked the, the devil in the spirit, the demon in it. And it left. You ever notice that? That when Jesus addressed stuff, he didn't address People. the sickness. He addressed the spirit behind the sickness. Yep. And it would be healed. And it left him. And then you think about it though. What he said was an expectation. He expected his disciples to be able to fulfill what, to, to continue on. He'd given them authority. He gave them authority before he died and was and resurrected. And he gave them the same authority then that he's given us since then to operate by the power of the Holy Spirit and to lay hands on the sick. He gave authority. And that he had an expectation that that would be, that they would do it. You think about it. When was it, when he was in the boat, asleep, the storm hits the, the sea there. They think that they're about to sink. He gets up and rebukes it and it quits. He, think about this. He had expected them to do it. Yeah, because he told them, let's go to the other yeah. side. He said, we are going to the other side. When God says, I'm, we're going to the other side, guess what? We're going to the other side. I guess that tells us we get to decide how the ride's going to be. Exactly. <laughs> but what we don't, yeah, because we expect it that everything always be smooth sailing. Mm -hmm. The enemy's going to come against you, but you're the one that has the answer. Mm -hmm. I love what you said a little bit ago, and I was going to use it as a point. When you said that she contacts you and says, everything I can pray for you for. And you're like, well, I don't know. That's a good sign. <laughs> if you have to think about it's it. Going good. It's yeah, well, good. it's not necessarily going good. You have the answer. I have people all the time, you know, if somebody wants to pray for me, I don't know what to tell them either. God's laid it on you. You just pray God's will for me. <laughs> yeah. There's some people I don't want to pray for me. <laughs> but you know what? When we are the ones with the answers, the church acts like we're the ones that are already in need, are always in perpetual need. And, and, and instead of teaching that, no, you are complete in him. You're the one that's got the answer. <clears throat> Instead of teaching that, we te we cater to that victimization mentality. It keeps people coming back. That's why you see every Sunday uh, after the after the preaching's done with and the altar call takes place, you see the same people come down to the altar every single Sunday. It's for the same reason. They have been convinced that they are the victims. They do not know relationship. They do not understand that they are the ones that already have the answer. If they're of Christ. Yeah. If they don't, they need to be born again. Mm -hmm. That needs to be a whole separate conversation. <laughs> that reminds me of something I come across online the other day. This uh, person was asking people randomly, said, if you could ask God one question and he would answer it, what would it be? And this one young man got up there and said, I wouldn't ask him anything. I would say thank you for what you're doing. No. And that, I was like, Really? Because he, this guy seemed to have his his vision right. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. He got, he understood that, yeah, okay, there's some things going on that I might not understand, but he's got it. Mm-hmm. Well, the Bible says his ways are higher than our ways, and his words yeah. are bigger yeah. than our words, so who are we to ask? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, our thinking leads where? Yeah. Yeah. So, and my best thinking has got me in some mess. Well, <laughs> you, you, you guys think about this. Sure, right I do that very often. We have to step into who we really are, who our identity is, wrapped up in Christ and his finished work. Mm -hmm. Jesus prayed, and you have moments of the flesh, but he was the one that had the answers. When he prayed, he expected an answer from the Father. (laughs) Today, in a lot of circles, if you like say, well, God said, God talks to you. (laughs) You're crazy. I don't, you know, I can't believe it. As a matter of fact, I heard somebody on the mainstream media interviewing, what is his name? Body uh, Buchanan or Balcom? uh, Body, yeah. The the black preacher, I I love him. He's just like amazing. Uh, I love to listen to him on, on some of his things. But they interviewed him and they did not like his answer to two women down there and they were like obviously wanting to try to trap him in a feminism mm-hmm. question mm-hmm. and he just didn't back off he said he said my I, i'm a herald of the gospel he said my i'm not here to cater to the culture mm-hmm. 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 And, and and uh but the first answer though that that woman gave when they started making fun of him says well this sounds a little misogynist don't it you know or sexist or something like that you know and um the what what they get from it, it is I lost my train of thought just that quick. <laughs> no. I'm old. Their answer he didn't to back off of it. Well, he didn't back off. No, he he didn't. Um, but I mean the, the thing was is that was was the answer that was surprising their answers were always based on they think that this is how you should be thinking about God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so his answer was just awesome. I, I don't cater to the culture. I, you know, I don't mm-hmm. read scripture based on what the culture is. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly... Huh? The same either way. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> no what now, is. now, if you look here, this is something that that I that I like. Um, Paul was talking. Let me get back to it. it. Says he died himself to renew your mind. If you do, your lifestyle and your thought process don't agree with that book, it ain't gonna change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If they gonna line up, you are gonna have to change. Mm-hmm. We are we are to. <clears throat> Change yourself to fit the scripture. Don't change the scripture to fit right. us. Right. That mm-hmm. is the renewing of the mind. That is the dying mm-hmm. to self. That is the taking up of the cross. It ain't. Yep. It ain't always convenient or easy. Exactly. It usually is not. In Philippians four, let's do the last couple of verses here on this one right here. On starting on verse eight, he says, "Finally, brothers, this is Paul talking. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable." Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any moral excellence and if there is any praise, dwell on those things. Now get this. This is what I want you to catch. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. So this is along the lines of what he was talking about. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, learn of me and is seen in me. So whenever he's talking this, whenever he says, follow me as I follow Christ, who is the ultimate person that is the example? Christ. Christ, Mm -hmm. right? So he's not saying follow what I'm doing just because I am your the apostle that's mm-hmm. here or I am the one that is the minister over this. He's saying I'm following him and I am doing the work. 
as I'm doing this, this should be an example to you to do the exact same thing. As long as I continue to do what he did and what he said, right? As I follow him. Yeah. This is missed now. Now it is, we have a group of people that you can be a part of. And we have decided that this is what we're going to believe in the scriptures. And this is what we're not going to believe. And you can be a part of that and listen to what I have to tell you as long as you agree to it. And if you don't think that, I mean, I, Tammy and I were at a, I think it was a 4th of July thing over in over there where Robin lives at, or Beverly and, and Unionville. Yeah, Unionville. They had a little 4th of July thing out there, and we ran into a pastor out there. And uh, he, he and I struck up a conversation. Now, he was with, used to be with the Southern Baptist Association, and it was a church. It was a pastor of a church. And he was praying and was wanting more of God. And he got baptized in the Holy Spirit yep. and started speaking in tongues. He's gone. He's not kidding. The moment that they found out about it, he said, I have been a pastor for 20 years. I've got all kinds of accommodations. I've been, you know, all kinds of things from the church. The moment that I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, they dismissed me. Speaking of John McCarthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From that moment. Now, do you see how skewed we're getting right now? This None of this stuff right here that I'm talking about can take place if the church knows who she is. I was about to say what you said about follow me as I follow Christ. That would require something of you. Because you would need to know what Christ was going to do or not do. You would have to know. Mm -hmm. Or otherwise, I wouldn't know if you wasn't following him. That's so, it. There is a personal responsibility. Absolutely. He didn't tell, he didn't say study to show yourself to be approved. As He didn't tell that only to the leaders of the church. No. To the pastors or people who are in the five-fold ministry. You don't blindly follow somebody. Exactly. I'm going to go off the how, how do you know? <laughs> This takes us all the way back to things that we've talked about in the past. David always tells me the guy's name every time because I can't remember. But him asking that question on Wednesday night was amazing. I mean, it's like everything was picture perfect. Okay. That's showing exactly what it was that, that needed to be asked. It wasn't that there was a, a fault in the teaching. The teaching was wonderful. How you do it? It was great. It wasn't because it was some cultish doctrine that got put in there. It was biblical. Down to the letter. I mean, it was great. And this guy asked what nobody else would ask. Would ask. I think it took everybody by surprise. He came like a child. This sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. We like to be pride, proud and, and prideful and not ask questions because we assume that everybody around us knows the answer and we're the only dummy. But really, nobody else Nobody knows. knows. you got to come asks. like a kid. you got to be willing to humble yourself and say, well, how do you do that? Yeah. But see, the thing is, though, is that we've, this is how the church has been taught. We have been taught. Those of us that have been in the church, you've been lucky. That's those of us that grew up in church, we have been indoctrinated <laughs> oh, wrong. that you, when you go to church, that you are only a spectator. Yeah. And that is how the, how the services are set up. Yeah. You have special singing. If somebody other than the pastor speaks, it's a special word. You can sing, you know, have like songs that don't include the congregation if you happen to be part of the choir. There's always things that have been set together to divide up the body of Christ, to give this mentality that there is some form of hierarchy in the church. And and the av and I say this for a lack of better terms, the average believer has been taught you are just a spectator. You're to come and sit in here. And we are to tell you what to do and to believe. 
You are the one that are supposed to sit and absorb all this tremendous information that I've got that I'm going to give you. Tell me I'm wrong. I mean, seriously, you guys know me well enough to know if you don't agree, tell me you don't agree and tell me why. That's what we've done. And we've set up, we've set our churches up like that. It is a throwback from Roman Catholicism. That that is the way that you go. You don't participate in it. You've got one person that tells everybody else what to believe. Mm -hmm. Well, you, the Roman Catholic, uh, the Catholics got it from the ancient Roman religions that were in the empire. Mm -hmm. They just transferred, as far as they're concerned, they just transferred one God for another God and kept their, their stinking satanic beliefs. Yeah. It was like an Aristotle lecture hall is what that is basically what that was like. And there was a form of that. Cause you think about, there was a form of that in, in Jewish synagogues and yeah, stuff. Talmudism. Yeah. But see, you think about it when Christ, think about how this worked. This, this right here should just like be an eye opener. If you didn't already know it, what Jesus took away from the Jewish religion, Veil torn, no more of this stuff. High priest, none of that, that kind of stuff. Everybody is on the same thing, playing field. Born again, he get you get to know him just like the the priests know and the religious leaders and and things like that. And then Roman Catholicism comes along and puts it right back in place. Divides man and God up once again. Mm -hmm. Now. I mean, they even took it a step farther. People there didn't even understand what Latin was. That's what they, they read the Bible out of whenever they met. And they would have to tell you then what to believe. But man, you don't think some corruption could come out of that? Mm -hmm. I'll take a few words here and there. And they meant it too because what, what was the first one that, that wrote the Bible in English? Um, Tinsdale? No. Uh, one of them, they burn it in the state. Yeah, that's Jonathan Tinsdale. Yeah, burn him at the stake. Well, they burn his bones. He had died 70 years earlier. So they burn him post-mortem. <laughs> I bet that showed him. Oh, I bet you that did too. Him. That's going to make a big difference. Well, they, they killed him. I can't remember. I thought they burned him to kill, and killed him. But anyway, no, they, he, he died of natural causes. And they killed him. Then we're, not talking, we're not talking the same one. The very first one that, that wrote it from um, from Latin to English... It was told, do not do it. And when he did it, they killed him for it. And so um, that's how serious they were to not get the word of God back into the hands of everybody. Well, they did that to every one of them, to John Haas, to Peter Waldo. These were all, well, Haas was German, but Waldo was Italian. That's where we get Waldensians from. But yes, yeah, what he was doing, he was writing it in Italian. They burnt, they took him to Turin and burned him alive. Yeah. So does that make any sense to anybody where we're supposed to be making believers and all that? Yeah. You know, does I mean, make believers and believe in what they like? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, you think about it. Whenever it came to these kind of things. It isn't about becoming a Christian. It's about becoming part of the Roman Catholic Church. That's what saves you. That's why they think that if they excommunicate you, they send you to hell. Yeah, you, you're going to hell. That's where you get incorporation from. You become part of the body. Yeah. You see how, they, I mean, it's, it's a lot. So, see, people believe this. They didn't know any different. No. Now we have the ability to know very much difference. In, in in this than what it was than what they were than, than what the people that were in there and yet we're still being done the same way and calling that normal Christianity you're told to come into a church you're to come in, sit down be quiet you'll see told to stand up, to sing a song when it's time then sit back down you're not part of the service. You're just one of those that's benefiting from the service is what their idea is. If you were to ask questions, do, do you imagine what, how bad it would throw people off if you were like, whenever somebody was saying something and you go, I 
I'm not sure that what you're saying is in the Bible. How bad it would throw everything off? Oh my God. They would usher you out. That's poor Catholic stuff. Talk about your excommunication. Give you the bad foot of fellowship. <laughs> yes. But we still do that. We, we still are doing that kind of stuff today yeah. because the, they can't do this. The, the thing that is, listen, you becoming a born again Christian does not scare Satan. Nope. You coming to understand your identity in him being transformed and knowing him scares him. When you're transformed, you become like the Lord. His image is restored in you. You are being Jesus on this world. That scares him. When you walk in the full counsel of God and operate through the power of the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus did, that scares him. I have people all the time talking about, God did, you know, Jesus did this because he was God. No, he did no, not. He did. he did everything as a man. He, it, the echinosis is talked about in Philippians. He emptied himself. He did not quit being God. He chose to walk without utilizing the virtue of him being God. He walked as a man, empowered by the Holy Spirit. After he was baptized. So who did yes. he with power until he was baptized? Yes. When the Holy Spirit came down. He did all things by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even being raised from the dead. He could raise himself from the dead from, by virtue of being God, but he didn't. No, he didn't. Scripture tells you. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit that is in every one of you. So you have the potential to walk just as Jesus did. If you will just believe it, that is a, see that is something that I have never quite figured out. It's like going into a war, knowing that you're going into a battle, and you're going and and the the military says, "Here's your rifle, here's your bullets, here's all all these things that you got. The, I got got you some grenades and and some." Uh, uh, missile things that you can carry with you. You can like wreak havoc everywhere you go. And you go, oh, I, I don't need all them bullets and stuff like that and, and things like that. I'm going to go out there and I'm just going to like walk around and, and amongst them and that's going to be enough. I mean, really, that's what we look like. All the things that he gave us to be more than conquerors in this world, the church has divided itself up to not utilize that and deny its even existence. Yeah. Just so that I don't have to be uncomfortable because to walk in faith, to grow in faith, is an uncomfortable thing. You don't grow in faith simply by just deciding that you're going to do it. You grow from faith to faith based on the things that you're going through. It's a combination of things. Being with him yep. stirs and grows your faith and it becomes effectual in your life when you step out and you do it. And all these things, these circumstances that you're going through, seeing God deliver you every single time. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them from all of it. When you see that, suddenly you quit being Someone that's struggling in faith and you just know because you know him. I know my father. I remember one of the greatest compliments that I ever got. I'm sure Casey would probably wouldn't care that, that, I, that I tell you. Casey told me this, that he was praying one day and he was talking about, uh, I can't remember what exactly the, the, how that began. I'm going to tell it the best I can, but he was talking to the Lord and he said that the Lord complimented me. And he said, the Lord told him, he said, do what Scott does because he will always follow me. He will always do what I tell him. That's what he said. He'll always do what I tell him to do. And I went, me. <laughs> Ooh, that's so awesome. <laughs> it's so awesome to hear somebody else say God told them something about you. You know? Yeah. 
there's a point where the church, guys, you got to die. Yep. You got to die to yourself. You got to die to the comfort. You've got to die to this, to the desire to maintain that comfort. You have to make a decision. I'm going to start walking as he walked. No holes barred, no boundaries, no nothing. I'm going to know him. Because you, do you think that if you say, I want to know my father, that he's going to go, no, nothing. you ain't got to the right level yet. <laughs> when you get the level 10, <laughs> then maybe we'll start to get a little interaction. No. He's like a father with, with a toddler that just started to run, walk. And he's going, come on, come on, baby, come on. To run to him. I'll show you things that you never ever thought that you could possibly see. If we would just believe. And stop denying him and his truth. Because it makes us uncomfortable. Or because the group of people that we decided that we were going to fellowship with. Says you can't believe that. It starts to sound absurd when you say it out loud, doesn't it? But that's what it is. You're to test everything. You're to test the spirits. If, something, if you saw an angel suddenly appear, you're not to accept the fact that it's an angel right off the bat. You're supposed to test him. Test the spirits. So why is it that whenever somebody comes along and they says, hey, you know, this this denomination or that denomination that we believe this right here. It already makes my hair stand up on the back of my neck that whenever you start telling me that, when you've got to list out your core values, mm -hmm. it should be, we believe this. We walk in this. <clears throat> we lay hands on the sick. We pray in tongues. We grow. Our goal is to know him and him who he sent, Jesus Christ. We are the sons and daughters of God, and we act like it. Not because we're trying to be. We recognize we are. Yep. That has been the issue that we have in this church. Not When I say this church, I don't mean this church. The church in general. Yeah. They don't know who they are. Absolutely. And when they don't, they look like the world. Why do you think it is that the church today, the visible church today, looks just like the world? Why do you think it is that we don't stand out anymore? Scripture says that we're peculiar people. In other words, we're, we should be strange to the world. Yeah, that's what it means. They should look at us and be able to spot us immediately. But we don't. We look like that and we seek to accommodate the world. Therefore, we become just like the world. We've got this foolish idea that we've got to mimic the world in some way to try to win the world to Christ. No, you don't. Go out, set the captives free, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. See how many people get, get you get their attention. I mean, it's amazing to me. People that, that how people can professing Christians, when you say, I've done this stuff, that they don't believe you. It makes me realize you just say you're of Christ, but you really don't believe. You just decided to be an adherent to a religion that just so happens to be one that's got Jesus in it. Yeah. But you're trying to adhere to it. You ain't his. You can go to a, a Baptist church or a Methodist church every day of the week, every Sunday, never miss a day. And bust hell wide open. Mm -hmm. 
You darken the doors of a church building doesn't mean anything. And the problem that we've got in this society today is that we think that that building is the church. Yeah. We've missed it. The core thing, the core thing that we have to come back to is knowing him where our identity can be wrapped up. And that the catalyst to every single thing about being of Christ is this. Believe. Believe. Do you know that belief is not an emotion? It's, it's a decision. Yeah. That's what everybody does. I, I've had that conversation. I'm going to say this and I'm going to close in, in this up. And this is primarily for those that, are, that, that watch on the video and, and things like that or live. The problem that we've got with Christianity today is, is that we, in, in this society, in, in Western culture, is really where a lot of this is, is that we've attached emotions to words. And then we decide whether or not we got whatever that word is based on do I have the emotion. The word believe. The, immediately when you say believe, the, an emotion is invoked in you because you've been taught that all your life, that belief is a feeling. They may not have ever actually said that, but in your mind, you when you determine whether you believe or something, in you, you search to get that emotion to determine and make the determination for you that I believe this or I don't believe this. So if you go, you ever heard anybody say, I, I don't feel like I, I can believe that. What does feeling have to do with it in the first place? <laughs> Has nothing to do with feeling. It's your decision to do it. Faith is simple. Faith may, we made faith hard. I, I never ever once been able to figure it out how somebody writes a 200 page book on faith. Faith is simply putting action to what you've decided to believe. When you decide to believe it, you have an expectation of it, right? That's where it talks about the hope. Okay, it's not hope like what we talk about in the United States when we talk in English, which is kind of like I re it, 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 that it's synonymous with a wish. I wish that happens, you know. No, a hope has a substance behind it that you expect it to happen. So faith is simply putting action to what you have uh, decided that you're going to believe. Simple, huh? Saved you all kinds of trees writing those books. The problem is, is that the church has done that. It's done that with the word faith. It's done that with all kinds of things, including the things that God has told us to be able to do. So whenever you put feeling attached to faith, which we do, same way we do with belief, and you look and somebody's over there sick and you go, and you've got the answer. You know, we were talking about that at the beginning. You had the answer. He loves them. Why? Why do y'all think that you're supposed to lay hands on the sick? Because God loves them. He wants them free. He doesn't want them sick. Jesus did that because he was showing who he was. No. Well, then it didn't work. He fulfilled scripture by doing it because the scripture said that that was what he was going to do. He healed people because he loved them. But for them to convince them, no, that didn't work at all. He did it right in front of people a lot of times, and they still wouldn't believe. So that just was a dismal failure, if that's what you believe. Same with you. Go lay hands on the sick. Because he loves them. You should love them. You should want them free. But when you start to do that, that feeling... You'll start looking in yourself again, and you'll go, "Wait a minute, do I have the do I have the faith for that? Do I need to run? I need to run home to my prayer closet for just a little bit and get souped up in some faith real quick, and then I'll run back. Just just tell them to stay there for a few minutes, and I'll be right back." It has nothing to do with faith, and whenever you finally get uh, with emotion, when you finally get that in your head. When you finally receive it in your heart, it will set you free. 
you will quit. Because see, what you have done, would have done is that you will have taken away one of the main weapons that Satan uses to stop a Christian from stepping into who they are. That is one of the very first things that he does. Without that, he has to try all kinds of different tactics other than that. But that's a, that's an easy one. That gets most people from right off the bat. I mean, how many of us have ever... I mean, we've been subject to it. I have. How many of y'all ever thought about, I think, I, God, they're sick. I ought to go there and lay hands on that. Well, what if it don't work? Uh, I might embarrass God. Do I have enough faith? I don't know if i got enough faith or not. Um, <coughs> we all done that. That is the battle against the flesh. The flesh wants to deal in emotions. The spirit man does not. It's simple, guys. Go do it. Do the work. Do what you've been taught. This should be producing fruit. It should be producing fruit in your life. It shouldn't be in any way where I, it's that that I'm doing something and, and the stuff that I'm teaching you guys, it just sits idly in you. You have to decide to, to, to act on what you've learned and walk in it. And once you do, it becomes like an avalanche. You just can't help it. It's boom, boom, boom. You'll just start doing it constantly. From the first time, I'm going to tell you what, it's actually, you actually have to be careful. Because God's faithful. And you can, if, and the flesh, whenever it, it can't stop you from doing what you're, he can't use the flesh to stop you. He'll try to turn the flesh on you in a different way. He'll try to get you to start concentrating only on that. On, on that, uh, how great that is. And to get you to start chasing after that rather than doing it for the reason that you're supposed to. It's supposed to be birthed out of love, Right? But then there are people who get to do it because God's faithful. He's going to, he's going to do what it is. You lay hands on the sick, he's going to heal them. So whenever it does, it suddenly you start running after them and trying to, you know, I want, oh, yeah, let's heal that. It's like, wait, I'm going to see God show up. I'm going to see God show up. He's in you. He should have showed up already. He actually was already there before you got there. So you late to the game. Amen. Have y'all got anything for this, or have I just babbled? Good point. Because I, at times, felt like I'm lost here. <laughs> <laughs> Learn a lot from rabbit trails. Hmm? Learn a lot from rabbit trails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then y'all should be learning a lot. <laughs> there should be a lot. There, there's so much. Hey, it's amazing that the simplicity of the gospel, people don't get this. It's like, you know, we did the bubble chart thing. Okay. It's like, this is the core of this, of becoming love of God, knowing God and all that. That is the center of everything. And you've got all these other little bubbles that come out of that. And you can talk about every one of those things. You can have a discuss that. But they all lead back to the same thing. <clears throat> they all lead to the same place. It's got to go back to, to identity and who you are and intimacy with the Father and knowing Him. Because if it isn't birth out of love, then everything that we're talking about means absolutely nothing. It means nothing. That's, that's why, I, you know, whenever I hear people that want to argue, one, people who argue against the gifts give themselves away with their relationship. And it, because, see, they're arguing from a standpoint that they're trying to stop you from doing something. Because, see, I'm, just to be perfectly honest, I don't think I'm going to stand before Christ and, and he's going to go, well, you try to do more things in me than I ever told you to do. I don't think I'm going to hear that. I think I'm far more likely to go, well, you know, I told you to do these things here and you didn't do them. Told you to walk this way, but that's okay. My grace is coming. 
But these people that do that, they're already telling you they're not transformed. They're telling you that they don't know him. They're not, things that they're doing is not birthed out of love. Because if you're transformed into love, then you're not, that kind of stuff, what, listen, if you looked at me and you told me, if, if Tyra says, I believe in Pinocchio, I believe he exists. I'm going to go, really? And you, she says, yes, I do. I got me a little thing of Pinocchio's in my room, you know, and all that stuff. And I, But I believe he exists. I'm like, okay. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> and that's going to be about the end of it. Besides you thinking I'm crazy. <laughs> but, I, but see, it does not <laughs> affect <laughs> truth, right? <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and fight Tyra. Now, you deny that Pinocchio exists. <laughs> you need to stop what you're doing. Right? Well, whenever someone that claims to be a Christ suddenly starts trying to tell other believers that are walking in the fullness of God, that believe this is what God has said, I can show you in the scriptures that this is what God said for us to do. And your goal is to stop them. That is a scary thing. But if you don't believe it, then why are you even worried about it? It's not like that Some that if, if I decide to go, if I feel like I'm going to go lay hands on the sick over here because God would do that. He would want me to do that. And you think for certain that can't be the case anymore. Well, where's my heart? Where's your heart? That shows you right from the beginning. Because how can I have to try to stop something that if I've been transformed into love? I would much rather err on the side of this than it would be to deny the existence of it and stop other people from doing it. But the fact is, is that we know that, that, is the, that he did say do this, right? We know that. There are apostles, prophets, preachers, teachers, all that stuff's still there. That state, all those things are in effect until he comes again. And and the church is, you know, because I don't know about you, but, you know, I mean, even if you want to take it from the standpoint where it says, until we all come into unity of the faith. Anybody seen unity of the faith in all the church? <laughs> the fact that you're trying to argue the fact that, that, that you can't do that thing shows it's not unity. But the fact is that until Jesus comes again, all that stuff will take place. But then when he comes, there is no need for that, right? There's no need to prophesy. There's no need for us to talk, speak in tongues, to pray to him. Why? We're with him. We've been transformed. Our body, mortal body, has thrown off mortality and taken on immortality. I need to lose weight before that happens. <laughs> Because if I'm going to get stuck in this body for eternity, I'm kidding. We'll get a new body. I'm expecting abs. That's not covered by, that's not covered by fat. Okay. That way I can go through. I'm just joking with y'all. Anybody got anything out of this? Anybody got anything you want to talk about or ask? Speak that none of us leave anything on the table. That hmm? we speak that none of us leave anything on the table. That we accept and um, take possession of everything that He has in store for us. Amen. Amen. Yep. But you know, and to do that, we we'll lay have to lay down our comfort, our even mm -hmm. our in, our desire for comfort. Mm -hmm. I remember Tammy talking about it, that she had never even thought about this way. The Lord said that, that he would give us His give us the desires of our heart. According to his will. You want I, to explain that? Yeah, I always thought that like everything you wanted, you'd get. And it means that our what's in our heart would be his desires. Mm -hmm. He would put the desires in our heart. 
not give us what we you desire. Desire, not the fruit of that. Right, desire. right. Absolute right. self. Right? He doesn't give us what we want. He puts yeah. desire in our heart. That, yep. But see, that's one of the verses that is taken wrong and out of context that the prosperity gospel abuses. Mm -hmm. Because they, they use that all the time. You know, he'll give you the desires of your heart. What do you desire? I want a Harley. Yes, he'll give you a Harley. That doesn't work. Okay. If that was the case, then everybody would be riding around in Harleys and new cars and big houses. And I wouldn't. I'm sure that. <laughs> the only ones that seem to ever have that kind of thing are the people that are getting all the money into them. That's that's uh, sowing the seed to this, getting the seed sowed to, like the Kenneth Copelands and the Jesse Duplantises and stuff like that. Listen, we got to go wise, wide open. Comfort is not our friend in this country, and people who are going to get caught unaware a lot. In this country about this because persecution is coming i keep saying it i know y'all get tired of me hearing me say that but it really is gotta prepare you do you, your heart's got to be in the right place because you're not gonna have time to try to suddenly go on the, and get the cliff notes and and <laughs> and and get there quick when it happens you're either going to stand or you're not uh, i come across something the other day that spoke to me and said I don't want to go enter into heaven well rested. Mm. That's good. This is true. I got all eternity to rest. But guys, y'all think about this. We got such a small little window of life to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, serious. I mean, we, I my mind thinks every so often that I'm in my twenties. <clears throat> Your body says, hold up. <laughs> I did the other day. I fell down the stairs. Oh, oh, oh gosh. gosh. Right there. Ow. There's a slick spot. I was putting her thing up. Mm. I didn't just fall on a step. And I didn't fall like I did in my 20s, where like I would go boom, and then get back up and look around. What, 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 what was graceful? Now, you lay there and do a systems check when you are. Yeah. No, no, no. I did oh, no, the. Did I, I break something? Pain's I did the Eddie Murphy fall. Your neck. <laughs> No, I did the Eddie Murphy fall. It was like, oh, Lord Jesus, I'm falling down here. I'm halfway down. I like to point I just kept on going. Oh, wow. I'm serious. I kept going. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down the stairs. It's just like Tammy said. I stopped and I went, oh. This, this work. That work. Pain, pain's getting is pain's there any, like, un, anything that's in pain that shouldn't be in pain oh, from what man. I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> and he's whined all week. Mm, yeah, well, yeah, that was something. A bit sore. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I went sore. down. It, it was something else. But it, yeah. mm -hmm. it doesn't so take you long. You do exercises that you don't normally do, I and mean, you get really sore because he's fall like that. He'll normally do that. So it's pretty, pretty sore. <laughs> he hit everything but the big time on the way down. Yeah. <laughs> the guardian angels caught you, but they said, it, we didn't say it's like no hurt, Scott. Well, we right. got you. <laughs> you didn't break anything. <laughs> My wife, actually, what it was, it was more of is like they, they were lecturing me. I, I fell down to things and they were saying, Didn't your wife tell you to get that cleaned off the porch there? <laughs> Her did. Yes. That's what it was. <laughs> I'm glad you're hearing voices. <laughs> Especially yeah, saying like things, that. those voices sound like you in my head. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's the hope. That's because so it probably I, is. I ain't believing it's an angel. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Easy. It's their voice. Is that right? Yeah. We uh but life is so quick. I mean I think I, I think back and it just seems like yesterday that I was in my twenties. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and just suddenly, you know, it dawns on you. I'm fifty seven years old. You start looking at stuff and they actually have you classified now in Senior. late adult <laughs> late life adulthood. And I'm like, What? Wait. <laughs> You know, AARP starts sending you stuff yeah. in the mail. Starts, you've been getting that for a long time. Uh, yeah, boy, that kind of AARP stuff. Boy. Hey, we members, that's some good stuff. Oh, yeah. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. It's worth $16 a year. <laughs> whoever that those people have got that, that keeps up with all their books and stuff need pay raises because the, the day you turn. It's in the mailbox. It's in your mailbox. The day you turn 50. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they got whoever's keeping up with that mm. stuff. And when you get Medicare age, you better study that. You know, you gotta watch those those the benefits. Stuff. Close out so can't close that. Oh, the can't the thing. You uh, need to close out. Oh, go ahead. Go. Yeah, okay. Have a good day. <laughs>